Welcome to Microsoft Flight Simulator with Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo. In today's episode, we fly from Brownsville, Texas up to Corpus Christi, and we try to take a look at where Boca Chica is to see if SpaceX's wonderful starport is in the game. Well, welcome back to Microsoft Flight Simulator with Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo. Now, you know, my number one passion in computer gaming is actually simulators. I 100% have to say the time I spend in games is more than dominated by flight sims over my 40-year experience playing games. Flight Simulator was one of the first titles I owned. And when I finally was able to afford my own Amiga 500, it was the first title I purchased. Yeah, believe it or not, Microsoft Flight Simulator was actually working on the Amiga back then. And I still have a copy of that today and go into it and just shake my head and go, wow, how far we've come. And I sounded a little bit uncertain about my love or like of this game in my reaction video, in my first impressions. And I want to say, after flying it for about six hours over the last few days, I have to say I have warmed up to it quite a bit. It isn't making me not like X-Plane, but what it is doing is making me love Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'm a firm believer that both of these games have to exist, because if they don't, then we just get a lot of blah from things. X-Plane has spent a ton of time over the last year, year and a half, trying to update a lot of pieces of its internals, of the background, of the foundation that makes up X-Plane, and they went straight in for the rendering engine. So they are now supporting Vulkan. Microsoft is still going to support Microsoft. So currently we're looking at a game that supports yeah, I'm going to say a DirectX 11, but you'd never know it because it's absolutely gorgeous. And in the future, it's going to support DirectX 12. I don't know what that means when a lot of games are leaving DirectX and going to Vulkan to get that extra oomph in rendering quality, that extra oomph in rendering speeds. So I'm not sure how it's going to affect it. And after the the second flight I made today, which will appear tomorrow, I'm kind of worried about frame rates in high density areas. But today we're in a very low density area, and the ab absolute reason for doing this one is for me to test out the flight model. Now that I've gone into the different elements of the preferences and selected everything I could to make it as accurate as it could be, for the stock aircraft. And I have to say this, I'm impressed. So I, I am now unable to give you a really good opinion over which one's better, stock aircraft. The stock aircraft in X-Plane are very good. The upgrades to the stock aircraft in X-Plane make them much better. And of course, those stock upgrades would be like the Zebo 737, or it would be the reality expansion packs for the Cessna and the Baron that are included in X-Plane. I also have to say there's a lot of, there's a lot more content for X-Plane right now because it's been out for quite some time, and there's going to be more and more that's made over time. But the stock aircraft, the stock aircraft without those upgrades, I'd have to say they're pretty much on par. I think Microsoft's development team here did a great job on the flight model. So it's not just all about great graphics, which I am going to say after my next episode, I have a little bit more criticism to that because it's great graphics in high density areas for people that could afford the system that you need to fly on. And I'm saying fly on because this is a simulator, it's not a game. And I'm just going to say that if you're flying around L.A., New York, London, Paris, Tokyo, Beijing, you name any major city, Philadelphia, Miami, whatever it would be, if you have those settings on Ultra, you're down in the 20s and 30s. And that's just the way it is. 
It isn't going to change. It isn't going to get better. It's going to be 20s and 30s. And that's it. That's all you're going to get. Unfortunately for me, I am, I'd have to say I am a little bit disappointed that that's the case because it means that you're going to have to buy a very, very high-end rig to make flight simulation run. And I'm, gonna, and I'm also going to point this out ground that ground, not everyone could Sierra afford that. And many people fly on medium and low settings in X-Plane and Flight Simulator because they have store purchased rigs or they have low end or medium end rigs. I also figured out how to work the controls here. And essentially, I, I am going to tell you this. It was a lot easier than I thought. You actually type the control that you're looking for in the first field at the top by clicking on that search field, and then you assign a button to it. So it's a lot easier than I thought. It's just not as intuitive as it is in x -Plane. There's also a couple of things that drive me crazy about the game, and I'm going to say it this way. Using AI to manage your radios, they never tune to ATIS, so you never get the altimeter with which to change your altimeter settings. And because I'm not paying attention to the radios because I'm not working it, as we get transitioned from one controller to the other, that information isn't stored anywhere. Like, like is he really doing the radios? I would expect that any time the co-pilot was to hear the altimeter, that he would change it out. There's also a very uh, I'm not very happy with the way that these little arrows on the ground work. Sometimes they point you over grass. Sometimes they point you into another aircraft. And a lot of times they point you into the wrong runway. And I'd have to say that that's probably something that's going to be fixed in the August 27th patch. The other thing is there are way too many vehicles that use the taxiways in this simulation and that needs to be corrected. So I have, I have some issues with it, and they're more like frustrations than not, um, I hate it. There are things that I know are going to be taken care of in the future, but here's one of those situations where there's just a vehicle sitting right on the taxiway, and that just needs to be corrected. And in, I know I have a lot more, you know, I have turned my settings up so I see a lot more of these aircraft and different vehicles, but I'm telling you, there's vans, and there's stairways, and there's trucks, and there are the trolleys that move luggage running around on the tarmac, on the ramps, on, on these taxiways way too often, and get rid of the pushback for GA aircraft. It's just annoying. Like, here's a forklift, I think it is, just sitting in the middle of the road. Like, why is it there? And there's a van over there on the side. I am literally doing a slalom around all of these vehicles on the road. And it is, well, at this point, I was laughing. I was laughing my rear end off because there were just so many. There's a stairwell. There's a stairwell just right in the middle of the taxiway because it belongs there. So having only flown a DA-40 once in my lifetime, I don't have a lot of experience or the necessary memory of this aircraft to say if it is exactly dead on accurate, but I do have to say the DA-40 is a very forgiving aircraft and it handles extremely well, kind of like a huge glider with a, an engine on it. And it's very difficult for you to mess up in it. In fact, I think it's almost impossible to spin. But I do have to say that the feeling of the flight model with all the different bells, whistles, check boxes, and sliders check too hard, it feels, it feels pretty much what I would believe to be dead on. The actual runways and the way that lines are painted on the runways from the auto-generated, auto-generated airports, I guess you want to call them, they sometimes go in curves or figure eights and that's kind of weird looking to me. I know these are all things that are going to be worked out over time, but I'm just pointing out things. But I'm saying even on takeoff with the wind and everything that's going on right now, I am loving it. There are some things I found with ATC 
that just are mind boggling. And I think that ATC might be pulling from whatever the active runways are for ILS and instrument, you know, for instrument landing approaches. And I'm going to give you a for instance. In the flight that I'll have up here tomorrow, I'm flying from Farmingdale, which is um, FRG, I think. I think it is. And going up to uh, Westchester, but I'm flying into New York City, over JFK, over LaGuardia, and then down the East River, and then up the Hudson until I get just east of White Plains or Westchester, and then turning into Westchester. And the runway at the time at Farmingdale, uh, it, it should have been runway one because it was a stiff wind blowing down the runway. But I think the ILS or the instrument landing approaches on on runway three two, but it didn't give me runway one for a general aviation visual you know VFR departure. So kind of weird, and I know that's just things that they can't have everything working right the first time, and that was kind of annoying. And that happens a lot in the game that. In areas where ILSs are available, and those are the runways that might be crossing or, or have a crosswind, they don't they don't hand you a runway that would be into the wind for a VFR approach, and that's something that I uh, I just had a little bit of an issue with. So I, I do have to say this: the scenery. I, I do turn it all the way up to 140 at some point. The scenery isn't. It is just amazing. I mean, it is the part that leaves you truly speechless. And you can swear you can see your own car when you fly over your house, and you can. But there are some things that just happen when you use satellite scenery to generate 3D objects. And when I'm flying in New York, and I have to say, it might have been because of the frame rate. It might have been because of the performance of my system, which is a 3700X, slightly overclocked by Ryzen Master, with a... EVGA 2080, not a TI, that's slightly overclocked by MSI Afterburner. Slightly, not a lot. I was getting like 20, 20 frames per second on high end in New York, and that's unplayable, and you're really asking people to have a system that could cost $3,500, four or $5,000, depending on the graphic card that you get, because yes, there are $2,000 graphic cards out there, people. Titans. And I think there's going to be two and $3,000 graphic cards with the implementation of the Ampere cards that are going to be out soon from NVIDIA. I am going to say this. Lots of RAM is a big help with this game. Have 32 gigs. 32 gigs is going to make your life better. And a graphic card with a minimum of 8 gigs. I'm hoping to God that there is a 3070, 3080 with 16 gigs that is in the five to $600, $700 price range once the new cards come out, but I doubt that. So I might need to look at the AMD cards because they'll have um, ray tracing, right? Built into them, but I don't care about ray tracing right now. What I care about is the ability to run the games that I run, which is Star Citizen, X-Plane, Flight Sim, Elite Dangerous, No Man's Sky, and a couple of others that I just have amazing fun with. So if you look over here, you'll see a canal, a channel, a river, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of square because I think it is actually cut by human device that goes all the way out to sea. If we follow that to just the south of it, the SpaceX Space Center, SpaceX Spaceport, whatever it would be, would be just directly south of that channel. I don't know what to call it. Let's call it a man-made river. So if you fly over that area, and here I am, I'm gonna show you that I am looking at different places to make sure that I have set the flight model up to be hard, because I, I really want this to be the closest it can be to real life. So I go in here and I, and I make all the switches on. I put everything on that I can to make sure that this aircraft is flying as true to life as a stock level aircraft. The modeling of updated versions of the G1000 system with synthetic vision is just amazing. 
And I know that Austin Myers and X-Plane spent a long time modeling every feature into the actual G1000 that they put into X-Plane, but this, this is as real as it gets. I would probably need to buy something like a Reality XP version of the G1000 or the G750 to get something that was better than this. So as far as it being in the simulator and not being as accurate as real life, okay. But for a simulator, this is amazing. Synthetic vision makes everything so much easier because if you're flying IFR, having just that extra bit of awareness means you're going to be a safe pilot. And I love that. And I wish that would be something that was required in all IFR aircraft in the future because it can save lives, okay? And that's what I look at. But I know that asking someone to spend that much money on something like this, a brand new avionics set for the aircraft would be a burden. So I'd have to say, yeah, in a, in a, in a perfect world. So I have a lot of pet peeves about usability, about intuitiveness with the GUI. And just being able to turn off the gauges and, and the information that you're being given right now. So you have the direction indicator in the top, you have all of your performance indicators in the bottom left, and you have some other items in the bottom right. Trying to figure out how to turn them off and on is kind of difficult. And it turns out they're right where you would expect them in a preferences pane, but there should have been a key assigned to it and you don't know what it is. And I think it should have been available like right here, like underneath either the right or left bunch of instruments it should have said, click W to toggle, click H to toggle, whatever it might be. As it turns out, it's in the chase camera view preferences in the preferences or options screens that you can go through. So if you're looking over here, I start to realize they're not going to be mo modeling anything new. I should have known better because my local airport isn't even modeled. And here's where we're going to find it. And we're not going to find it very quick. So I am just going to let this go as I'm talking. So my airport is not modeled to what it is today. It's modeled to what it was about five years ago. So a lot of the data that they use to construct many of the airports and much of the scenery inside of this game might have been from five years ago. And it might have been easier for them to get that information. What I'm hoping is that Microsoft starts to dump the Bing information on a quarterly semi-annual or annual basis so they could upgrade the scenery. If it's truly the AI that's building all the 3D images or 3D buildings and making the scenery look the way it is, it shouldn't be hard for them to have that run twice a year or once a year at least. So when we're flying, we could actually fly over the familiar landscapes that we have in our areas and fly into the airports that are familiar to us. It's just beautiful. I, I have to stop and look at it every now and then because this flight, I, I thought it wasn't going to be very nice, but it turned out to be exceedingly nice. So at this point, I have terrain detail set to 100. Later on in the flight, I up it to 140. There is a vast difference in what you see. You start to see waves on the ground, things like that. But again, when you start moving those sliders up, when you start ticking the box on higher end graphics, you're going from first 50, then to 40, then to 30. And once you drop under 30, it's unplayable. That New York area was in the 20s when I was flying it. But I continued to do it just so people could see what it's like. Even if you had a system that cost around $2,300, which is what mine was for the motherboard, the processor, the graphic card, the RAM, the hard drives, um, the coolers, all the things in it. It was an expensive system, but of course it was bought over time. So I'm giving you those costs over a three year period. All right, we're looking out, well, two year period, sorry. And we would be right over here. I mean, it would be right in this area over to our, I would say it would be right off our nose and Boca Chica, the SpaceX 
spaceport is not modeled in the game right now, and that's okay. So what I do now is I just turn north, and we're going to go up to Corpus Christi, and I am going to land at the Navy base up there, hoping to see some military jets, which I know I'm not going to see because I don't think that they have licenses from Boeing or from Grumman, Northrop Grumman, or from Lockheed to put any kind of aircraft that they own the rights to the images, to, to, to the, well, you get it. Today, these days, you actually act, have to get licensing from the aircraft manufacturers to put them in the game, which is why you see the Cessnas being called Textron, because that's who owns Cestra, Cessna right now, and the same thing with the Pipers and the Beechcraft, all owned by Textron. Just amazing. I think the scenery is awesome, it's gorgeous, and it is just wonderful. I'm going to move the flight along right now and try to get us to a place that's closer to Corpus Christi. So having flown most of the distance between Brownsville and Corpus Christi along the coast, all I have to say is by this point I had moved the slider up to 140 and you start to see the waves that are down along the shoreline. See a little bit more detail in the actual rendering of those satellite maps. And although we're over what I would call a very sparsely populated area, I was still only able to get to 36 to 40 frames per second. And I'm sure I could do a little bit more tweaking to up that. But I really want the first few videos of mine going up to be about how beautiful the sim looks. And it does indeed look beautiful. Look at the clouds. The clouds are very realistic looking. They're amazing. Just flying above them, seeing the translucency, or that's so opaque, but they are kind of puffy and almost like hovering fog. I love it. It's just gorgeous. Texas coast. I never knew it would look this beautiful. Really nice. So I've got my, I have reservations about the game because I know that Microsoft tries to build engines with which to make money and Xbox is one of their engines and this will be on Xbox. So I expect a huge marketplace for this game. Currently there is a marketplace inside of the game but they're still allowing people to sell you things direct. So I could buy the Orbex sceneries inside of the game, or I could go to the Orbex installer and buy it there. So I'm pretty happy that they're still letting third parties have their own way with being able to sell you the product. I'm not sure if they're still being charged some kind of licensing fee, if it's going to increase the cost of third party developed sceneries and 30 party developed aircraft over time that's not something i know but what i do know is that it seems that microsoft is not doing what i expected which was to block third parties from selling directly so that to me makes me feel happy what i do see is a lot of potential for this game for the simulator i see a lot of opportunities for improvement especially in the frame rates hopefully directx 12 helps with that. I would hope that maybe some point they would also try to move to Vulcan, but I doubt that because Microsoft probably wants to just keep their own API in there, right? That makes a lot of sense. What I'm seeing though is the future of simulation. I'm hoping that at some point X-Plane could catch up with the scenery and push things a little bit further because I don't want one of these two companies to be so much better than the other that the other can't compete. We need competition in the space and we need it to be close competition because we want both to get better. VR will be coming to the game at some point. And of course that might mean lower frame rates, it might. But what it's going to mean is that with the fidelity of what we have here, being able to look over your shoulder when you need to, being able to look down at your instruments when you need to, I have a feeling that things are going to be so good in this sim and VR, they're going to blow your socks off. 
which makes me wonder. Because right now I have an Oculus Rift S, and the resolution and the refresh rate aren't that great. So I know that the HP Reverb 2 will be out soon, and that looks like it's the end-all be-all for seated VR. And I'm wondering if that's something that will be in many of your future. I'm going to hang on to my Rift S for now and deal with the fuzzy instruments and a couple of other things that I'll have to deal with because I don't want to have to invest in another headset just yet. My big thing is I, I really want a wireless headset at some point and that's what I'll be waiting for. But I think VR is really going to take this sim to a new level and I think at that point you're going to be able to capture that real experience of flying in general aviation and commercial aviation aircraft and I think you're going to absolutely love it. So we're coming into Corpus Christi. It was a beautiful flight and six hours of flying has changed my mind. Six hours of flying has made me rejoice about flight sims again. It's truly my passion. It's the game or type of, it's the genre that really got me into computers from the beginning. And all I have to say is the future looks bright for flight simulation. And I can't wait to see some of the products that come out for this sim over the next year. New sceneries, new aircraft, and maybe even new controllers. I would love for Logitech to update their yoke and probably update it by giving the yoke a 90 degree deflection instead of 45 and making it less plasticky. But those are the things I'm hoping for. A little bit rounded flight over here coming in to Corpus Christi in a DA-40, which probably would not happen all that often in real life. We're going right into the Navy field. So on final, I'm going to say I do have one last pet peeve, and that I've already mentioned before, and that's the co-pilot. I think his AI needs to be worked on. I really believe that procedure and that should always be before you turn tune the radio to a tower and say that you're inbound, you should always have the ATIS information, and that should be something that's worked into there so at least I can get my self wrapped around what runway I'm landing on and also why I'm landing on that runway by listening to the winds and also getting that altimeter. Second thing is, don't rely on checklists, they're not accurate. If you really want to know how to start these aircraft up, you can download the PDFs or the checklist for any of these aircraft offline. Most of them are public domain. A lot of them have the startup checklist, but don't have uh, climbs, descents, emergency, you know, emergency procedures. Those are all things that you can get online. But again, they're not true study level aircraft and don't claim to be. But it's always good to do things by the book. I'm not doing that just yet. Right now I'm just getting a feel for the sim. And I hope you all enjoy my videos. I hope those of you that buy the game follow along with me. So now it's going to be something I'm going to request from all you. If you are indeed watching my videos about X-Plane, give me a place to fly from. And two, that could be done in an hour or less. Tell me the airport you want me to fly to and the aircraft you want me to fly. And they all have to be part of the deluxe premium ultimate package, whatever the $120 package was. So I could fly any of those. And I'm going to say this for the time being, I'm not an airliner driver, so I'm not a heavy driver. So if you want me to fly the airliners, I'm going to have to say, no, keep it to the general aircraft just right now. Even if it's the TBM, I'll fly that. If it's the... Um, if it's any of the corporate jets, I'll fly those, but I tend to stay away from the airliners because to me, airline flight, it, it doesn't, it's all procedure. It's something that you do on a stream when you're talking to friends. It's all procedure. You're flying on, you're flying on autopilot most of the time, and it takes you a hell of a long time to start up the aircraft, to program your FMS and then to get to the runway and take off. Before you've even taken off, you've probably spent 40 minutes to an hour talking to your people. So I think that those are done best on a live stream. 
But if you want me to fly somewhere in one of the GA aircraft, even if it's one of the corporate jets, just put it in there and I'll do it. If you like this video, please click the thumbs up button below. It'll really help my videos get more attention, draw in more viewers. And if you do subscribe or have subscribed in the past, please remember to click that bell-shaped icon below so you get notified of all my future videos. And folks, I'm not going to make you wait and watch me all the way to the ramp. I'm going to let you go right now so you all be safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.